عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته حياكم الله وبياكم إن الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونعوذ بالله من شرور أنفسنا وسيئات أعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله اللهم صل وسلم وبارك على سيدنا وحبيبنا محمد صلى الله عليه وعلى آله وصحبه, وصحبه وسلم تسليما كثيرا uh, Again, بارك الله فيكم for coming to this series I'm sure everyone is yearning to know how to love Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala For those that are new and haven't attended this course before, I've seen, mashallah, a few new beautiful faces. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless you all. This is a series we started approximately six months ago, uh, more than that, sorry. We ended the series, or our last class in the series was around six months ago. So we are continuing with, with this series, inshallah, that we stopped approximately six months ago. Uh, and that's due to me being overseas. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, so we'll give a bit of a recap inshallah ta'ala and from next week we will begin where we left off from last time the idea of this my dear brothers and sisters is as the title says know him to love him and for those who attended uh, Jum'ah today the Shaykh actually touched upon this very important point which is claiming to have taqwa or claiming to love Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the first place. Like what we all claim, sahih? Everyone loves Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Everyone, no one can deny this or else you won't be a believer in the first place. But that true love, that true love that comes from the, yani the deepest part of the heart is only comes forth with knowledge, with true knowledge. And a simple example that we can use to understand this point is between a husband and wife. For those who love their wives, Yanni. <laughs> but when you first meet this girl, soon to be wife, you don't know her. She doesn't know you. There seems to be some connection. So we said, Yalla, Bismillah, let's get married. First week, second week, third week, fourth week, fifth week, first year, second year. What happens? Eventually what? The love starts to increase. And then maybe after the third year, it starts to decrease. We don't know. We're talking about the general circumstances of two people that get along. Why does this love increase, my dear brothers and sisters? Why? It's a simple question. Why? Why do you love your wife after 10 years? More than you originally loved her, when you first met her, why? Why is that the case? Ah, because you got to know her more. As they say, you know her inside out. What she likes, what she doesn't like, what makes you happy, what makes you laugh. This only increases and it becomes a deep, true love, meaningful love that people sacrifice their entire lives for their spouses. And for their parents that they love so dearly. Why? Because of this knowledge of each other. This understanding of each other's nature. That you don't get by just meeting the first time or the second time or the third time. The same thing with brothers. Subhanallah. When you first make a connection with a new brother, he's just a random to you. But is that the same as a person that you've known for 10, 20, 30 years? Our dear brother now, Abdullah, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala have mercy upon him, has passed away. Young boy. Who, how many of us cried? Some of us cried, some of us didn't cry. Why? Because some of them, some people had a very close relationship with this brother. And some people just knew him as a brother, a random brother. For no doubt, the effect is not the same. And we can give this same example. As to our relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. 
why many of us, my dear brothers and sisters, are not willing to sacrifice the smallest amount of sacrifice for Allah or His Messenger. Why? Because that true love is not manifested in your heart. That's what it is. That's what it goes down to this point of love. Because love dictates following. Love dictates following. Shuf, look at the wording used. If you were truly, if you really love Allah, what did the what did Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala say in the ayah? Surah Ali Imran? Huh? Follow me, meaning the Prophet. Allah, and then Allah would love you. There is three things here. Three things here that we find in this ayah. Firstly, loving Allah. Secondly, what does this love manifest in your day-to-day -day life? Which is al-ittiba, following the Prophet Sallallahu Thirdly, and this is the ultimate goal, my dear brothers and sisters. The goal that we're living for. The goal that we love for. The goal that we live for. And hopefully the goal that we die for. يُحْبِبَكُمُ Allah. Allah in return would show you His love and He would love you. Allah, the Almighty, imagine this. Your creator, your sustainer. The Almighty Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran that He will love you. Allahu Akbar. This is what life is, my dear brothers and sisters. This is what Islam is. That love uh, could be empty also, could be fake. You just say it. No sacrifice. Subhanallah, one of my mashaykh in Medina, he says this word a lot. He repeats this word a lot. He said, we want Jannah, and yet we are not, we never slept a night being fearful to protect the deen of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This word, Wallahi, resonates so much. And a person who really understands what the sheikh said, your heart will pump out of fear of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, will shake. How many of us have slept here? Fearful for their lives or fearful for themselves or for their wealth? For the sake of Allah. Put your hand up. Who has sacrificed this much? Uh, no one. Is that because no one's responsive or because there's no one? I think it's the latter. No one has done that. And yet we expect, we expect all of a sudden that Jannah is wajib for us. Khalas, yakhi, we're going to Jannah, no problem. Sunnah salah, fard salah, salah khalas. We, we pray later, inshallah. We do this later. We sacrifice for Allah later. What happens later? Like the example of this young boy that we're talking about, subhanAllah. 19, 20 years old. That later didn't come for him, my dear brothers. Later didn't come for him. I'm sure he had plans to go to Hajj. I'm sure he had plans to pray more, maybe read more Quran. Especially after Ramadan just passed not long ago. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, come back to me. Come back to me. Khalas. There is no age limit. The trip to the Akhirah does not require an age limit. So this is the manifestation of love, my dear brothers and sisters. And this is the point of this course. And to add to that, what is the best way? Uh, the best way to know Allah, thus loving Him. What is the best way? To ask Shakespeare about it? Or to ask the Mu'tazila, for example, about Him and Ahlul Kalam? Or to ask who? Uh, how do you love Allah? How do you know Allah? How, my dear brothers? Someone answer. Huh? You learn what? Huh? Fas'alu, fas'alu ahla dhikri in kuntum la ta'alamun. In kuntum la ta'alamun ma'adha? Is'aluhum ma'adha? 
ايوه ما شاء الله يزيك الخير من الذي قال هذا انت ما شاء الله الله يزيك الخير فاعلم انه لا اله الا الا الله have knowledge of allah طيب the next question How, where do we seek this knowledge from hmm? quran and sunnah ما شاء الله the quran and sunnah طيب why do we seek this I'm not, I'll this particular knowledge from the Quran and Sunnah. Why? Huh? Are they authentic? The Sunnah is authentic, all of it? Hey, the authentic Sunnah is authentic. Okay, it's authentic, but Shakespeare's book that's with us today, it's also authentic. Why, my dear brothers? Go up a level. Go up a level. Why do we take this as the source of our knowledge to learn about Allah, thus making us love Allah? Because it came from Allah. Sahih. Allah is a And if you want to know about someone, do you ask someone else about him? Or do you go and ask that person? Brother Ayman, oh, he doesn't like onions. Trust me, I know him. But then he comes and says to you, I like onions. I like onions in my extra saucy kebab. Extra onions and extra barbecue sauce. I say to him, no, he doesn't like it. Who would you believe more? And who would you trust? And who would you accept? Of course, you accept the person himself. So this is why the sauce. I bought the example of kebabs because I've been hanging for a kebab for the past six months. <laughs> but the source where we get our knowledge from, my dear brothers and sisters, is only one source. And that is the source of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That he has revealed in his book, Al Quran, upon the Prophet, وسلم, who has then taught it to us in the best and most precise and magnificent manners. Know Allah to love him. How do we know Allah? Let's read the Quran. What does Allah say about himself? Let's look at the names that Allah has named himself. Because you know someone from their name. What does this name <coughs> entail? Every name has some type of characteristics. Yes or no? Every name has some type of characteristics. Let's discover these names. Let's talk about these names. Let's talk about the characteristics of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Then you know Allah. And then what did the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa say? Al-Islam, Al-Iman, and then what? What's the third level? Al-Ihsan. Ihsan has two levels. What are the two levels of Al-Ihsan? In Hadith Jibreel, everyone knows. أَن تَعْمُدَ اللَّهَ كَأَنَّكَ تَرَاهُ This is the ultimate level. Allahu Akbar. The ultimate level. To worship Allah as if you can see Him. As if Allah is right in front of you. That's how, how much effort and sincerity that you're putting towards this particular action that you're directing to Allah or for, for Allah. And then if you can't reach to that level or we haven't reached to that level yet, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us this level, all of us. Then we go to the next level. فَإِلَّمْ تَكُنْ تَرَاهُ if you're not, you haven't reached that level of Iman yet, then know that Allah is watching you. Know that Allah is there watching you. Talk about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah, what does Allah mean? Ar-Rahman, what does Ar-Rahman mean? Okay, the merciful, okay, the merciful. What does the merciful mean? What does the merciful mean to you as an individual Muslim? Does it mean... That you have an open book, unfortunately, like many people translate this word, this name of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to mean I have an open ticket to perform every haram under the sun. That's what some people translate these acts of worship to and these names to. Allah is a Rahman means I can do every haram and I'll still enter Jannah. Most of us have this mentality. Ar Rahman, Ar Rahim. We read Ar Rahman, Ar Rahim every single salah. What's the difference between them? 
What's the difference between them? What's Ar Rahman? What's Ar Rahim? Who is Ar Rahman? Who is Ar Rahim? Alhamdulillah, Rabbi Alami. Ar Rahman, Ar Rahim. Maliki, Yomidin. Look at this. Malik. Who's Al Malik? And these are the names that we spoke about. We'll give a little bit of a recap, inshallah, soon. But these are very important things to discover and to understand and to think of and ponder upon during salah. And that's how someone reaches to khushu'. Now, this is the same question that is repeated many, many, many times. How does someone become in a state of khushu' or how does someone gain that concentration in salah? How? By thinking about these things. Allahu Akbar. In every action that we perform. Allahu Akbar. What does Allahu Akbar mean? Allahu Akbar. Then I have to pray quickly because my boss is going to get angry. Allah is not Akbar then to you. Allahu Akbar. Then I'm scared for such and such and such. Then you haven't made Allah Akbar in your life. The greatest thing in your life. The biggest thing in your life. You haven't. Subhana Rabbi al Azim al A'la wa bihamdi. What does these words mean? Thinking about these words, not just generally, not just generally, thinking about what they mean to you. As one of the Mashaykh said, a person should feel as if the Quran was revealed to him directly. That's the relationship that you should have with the Quran. As if every word in that book is directed to you personally. And think about what these words mean to you in your life. Ar Rahman. You don't come and say, Allah is the most merciful. You come and say, SubhanAllah. Allah saved me from this accident last week. Look how Allah had mercy. My child was about to be run over. Allah saved me. SubhanAllah. Look at this. Allah blessed me with a good wife. Subhanallah. Hadi. Rahma min Allah Azza wa Jal. Allah blessed me with a bountiful, a good, good amount of children. This is all from the Rahma of Allah Subhanahu wa Ta'ala. Every day I wake up with health and wealth and a shelter and a warm bed. And when it gets hot, turn the aircon on. Wallahi, if I wasn't for the mercy of Allah, none of this would be possible for you. <laughs> As the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said in an authentic hadith, that if this dunya altogether was worth or amounted to the wing of a mosquito, he would not even give a kafir a drop of water. Can you imagine this? This drop of water that enters a kafir mouth, And a Muslim's mouth also is the definition of Ar Rahman Ar Rahim. Again, we try to understand Arabic because we don't understand Arabic. And that's because the ones who don't understand Arabic have fallen short in their duties towards Allah. Let me put that out there. It is an obligation, my dear brothers and sisters, to understand the words of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. As it said, this is an obligation upon every single Muslim. And the ones who do not or are not striving at least to learn Arabic even once a week, even once a month, yes, then no doubt they are falling short in the eyes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is the reason, ya ikhwah, that we are in the state that we are in today. Is because the enemies of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has successfully detached our language from our people. And this is why Napoleon, who was known to be a genius of his time, when he reached the shores of Egypt, the first thing he called his government or his delegation, whatever you want to call it, and discussed is how do we remove this Quran from these people? 
because we've seen time and effort after effort after effort after effort we're, un we're unsuccessful to destroy these people the muslims and they are happy to die for allah we love the dunya and they love the akhirah subhanallah how can you win against the people like this that they look at your sword and they see paradise at the end of it or they look down the barrel of the gun and they see jannah at the end of it how do you win against these people yeah? these people oh, this is a kufar saying this of course oh, they seek refuge in the shaytan how do we win against these maniacs these crazy people really subhanallah from human logic this is insanity insanity the kufar they fight other countries in order to gain riches to gain land to gain popularity to gain power but this little miskin muslim he doesn't do that for any personal benefit subhanallah and yet he is still running towards the enemies not fearing anything and the best example of that that we can take in our recent history is what happened in afghanistan barefooted bedouins that live in the mountains eating bread of their bread and idam uh, what they call idam like a soup type of thing this superpower of the world america couldn't overcome them Ajib, yeah. Ajib. using the oldest form of technology ak-47 this is what the brothers have subhanallah why it's called 47 because it was made in 1947 look how old it is and they're still fighting with this subhanallah after 20 years and trillions of dollars the superpower of the world and the advancement of the world of technology they were not able to overcome these barefooted people that live in the mountains subhanallah. does this not astonish you this happens from the mercy of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala this happens from the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Ar-Rahman, Ar-Rahim. And then we spoke about Al-Malik, and Al-Malik, and Al-Malik. Sah? Who remembers some points of this? Yalla, yakhwa. It's only been six months, not that long ago. Bismillah. Ah, yeah, Ayman, you were there. Mm. King of the Day of Judgment. Um, Is that what I said? King of the Day of Judgment only? No, it was free. Uh huh. And then Malik was the owner of the level, I think. And then Malik was the Lord of Him. Malik is the king of everything. Everything has been created. No. Uh, Malik is the owner. Ownership of the kingdom. Right. Malik is the, yani the difference between Al Malik and Al Malik is that one can have general uh, dominion over the affairs, but it doesn't mean doesn't necessarily doesn't uh, uh, what do you call it make it necessary that he owns everything. So, like the prime minister today, or like the king of the countries, he's the king of the whole country. He has general guardianship and ownership of everything. But it doesn't have specific specific ownership, صح? طيب. And Malik is the owner. Hey. And it doesn't necessitate to be an owner that you are a king of everything. You could be the owner of your car, but yet, and I gave this specific example. You could be the owner of your car, but yet without license plates and Vic Rhodes approvals, approval, you're not going to be able to drive on the road. See the difference between Malik and Malik? And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, no doubt, is both Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala look at the greatness of Allah and the Malik is Sigat Mubalaga is the Ulama say huh of the both it gathers the both the meanings of both resonate about this what does this mean to us that Allah owns everything and Allah 
is the king of everything. This means, for example, when the year has passed on your money, and Allah said, a year passes over your money and you have the nisab, you have to pay zakat. How much? 2.5%, correct? But we find many of us, say, Allah, this is, the year is coming too quick. Yeah. Uh, this day, every day it's coming. I don't want to pay this. Khalas, this year we don't want to pay. Do you own that money or does Allah own that money? So what happens if the owner commands you to give that money and you don't give it? Do you not deserve a hefty punishment? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says about those who refrain from zakat. يَوْمَ يُحْمَى عَلَيْهَا فِي نَارِ جَهَنَّمْ فَتُكْوَى بِهَا جِبَاهُهُمْ وَجُنُوبُهُمْ هَذَا مَا كَنَزْتُمْ لِأَنفُسِكُمْ The day that these items will be boiled, melted and be placed on your body, on your chest and on your head. This money that you withheld because you withheld it from its true owner and that owner of the money entrusted you with this, if we can say so. This is an entrustment from Allah. You don't really own yourself. You don't really own your money. You have this money because the owner of everything has placed this in your control. How misery must we be that Allah gives you money and Allah gives you wealth. And then he says, I gave you this wealth, give it back to me or a portion of it only. Again, the generosity of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the mercy of Allah. He gives you something and then commands you to give it back. And not only that, he gives you 10 times the amount and more. 10 times and more. Up to 700 times, up to more. لا يعلمه إلا الله. And Nabi Sallallahu said, Allah will give 10 times the amount. One hasana is worth 10. And in the hadith, Nabi Sallallahu said, up to 700 times. And then he said, beyond that, to an amount that no one knows except for Allah. Look at this. Look at this mercy. Look at this generosity. And it's from him. Yani it is pure justice. It is pure justice to take that money from you and not give you anything in return. True or not? Just as it is pure justice for Allah to give you a child and take the child away from you. True or not? It is pure justice for Allah to give you something and take it away the next day. This is for Allah, yes. I come and say, here brother, take my phone, give it back to me tomorrow. Would anyone be upset if I come back the next day and take it back from him? No one will be upset. Because they know it's not his. They know it's not for me. This is not mine. Allah gave it to me just one day. Hold on to it for me. Of course, we're giving human examples so we can understand the picture. We never give, we never describe Allah as similar to any of his creation. But this is how we manifest these type of meanings and names into our life. In saying so, does Allah not have the right to say to you, this is haram and this is halal. He made you, subhanAllah, created you, gave you your sustenance, gave you your health, gave you your body. But he said, you can't do certain things. Is that not pure justice? Does he have not, does he not have the right to say this? Yes or no? And yet we have some so-called Muslims saying, I have freedom of choice. I can do what I want, yeah, we're in a free country. Allah said homosexuality is forbidden. What do these fools go and do? Promote homosexuality. Yeah, Allah gave you this tool to use in halal. And you go and say that this tool could be used in other than what Allah has permissive, permissive. What an oppressor you are. What an oppressor you are. Oppress yourself and oppress the people. Freedom of choice, yeah. I'm in a free country. 
we will see where this freedom will take you on your Qiyam when Allah comes to question you about the property that He has given you Himself and that He has provided for you Himself and that He has protected for you all of these years. La ilaha illa. Do we not have shyness in front of Allah? To come and make something that which Allah made haram, we make it halal on the premises of free speech and freedom. La ilaha illallah. La ilaha illallah. This is what it means that you are owned by Allah. And subhanallah, again, on this point, if Allah was to tell you to perform an act or to do something that brings you harm, that brings you harm, would it be just for him to do so? It would be just because it's his property. You have a car, you go smash it with a hammer, no one's going to say anything. It's your property. True or not? You have a clothes, خلص, I want to chuck this clothes today. I don't want this clothes. I'll rip it. I'll put a hole in it. I'll do whatever. And yet, Allah, Jalla Jalal, Subhanahu wa Ta'ala, Wallahi, He does not command us to do anything except that it is a benefit for us. And if he was to say something that is not a benefit for us, he has the right to. And yet, he doesn't command us to do anything except that it has a direct or indirect benefit to our personal lives and our social lives. As the kuffar every week, we hear them crying about the, the, the punishments of Allah. How cruel to chop off the hand. SubhanAllah. What about the person's money who's got stolen? How cruel to let this person continue stealing? Isn't that cruel? How cruel to stone someone to death? Is it not crueler that this person's heritage is destroyed and he doesn't know who his father is and he doesn't know who his parents are? He doesn't know who his blood sister and blood brothers are? How many of a case do we see sisters and brothers getting married? By mistake, of course. Is that not more cruel than ending the situation on the spot and making sure it does not continue? La ilaha illallah. Nothing Allah does for us except that it is benefit for us on a personal level or us on a social level. And if he was to do something to oppress us, he has the right. Because why? Because we are his property. We are his property. Go jump off the cliff. Go jump off the cliff. You have no better thoughts. Do what Allah says to you to do. La ilaha illa. This is how we understand and think about these names. On a personal level, everyone must think, Ya Ikhwan. At tadabbur in itself is ibadah. Afala ya tadabbarun al Quran. Am ala kulubin akfaluha. Afala ya tadabbarun al Quran. Walau kana min indi lahi, la wajadu fihi ikhtilafan kathira. Do we not ponder and think upon the, upon the Quran and about the Quran? Or our, our, uh, our hearts are chained and locked? Allah says another verse. Do we not ponder upon the Quran? And if it was surely from other than Allah, you would definitely see a lot of uh, differences or contradictions. That's the word. You will see many contradictions. Reflect. Tadabbar. Tafakkar. Inna fi khalqi samawati wal ard. Wa khtila fi layli wal naha. La ayati. Li ulil alba. Who are the ones that ponder? Allah, look, listen to these beautiful ayat, my dear brothers and sisters. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that verily in the, the creation of the heavens and the earth, are clear signs to those who are mindful. Those who are mindful, those who have intellect, those who think, those who ponder. Not those who just do actions because their parents taught them to do this way. Bid'ah, not bid'ah, haram, halal, we do it because this is what I was raised on, ya 
A person who speaks like that has no brain. Because Allah says the ones who ponder are those who have brains. Ulu al albab. Albab jam' lub. Wal lub huwa al aql. Alladina, and then Allah continues. Alladina yadkurun Allah al qiyam. Wa qu'udan. Wa ala junubihim. Wa yatafakkarun fi khalqi samawati wal aq. ربنا ما خلقت هذا باطلا سبحانك فقنا عذاب النار يا سلام look at والله يا أخي listen to what I just realized in this ayah this beautiful ayah man after mentioning those who reflect upon the creation of the heavens and the earth and then mentioning that the ones who do that are the people who have minds and then he says those who remember Allah standing and sitting and lying down and they ponder وَيَتَفَكَّرُونَ فِي خَلْقِ السَّمَاوَاتِ وَالْأَرْضِ And they ponder after that upon the creation of the heaven and the earth and they ponder upon everything that was mentioned. What does that pondering, that reflection, what does it make them do? What's the action that they performed? SubhanAllah, listen to this my dear brothers. What is the first action that they performed after reflecting upon the creation and heavens and the earth. What is the first action they, they did? They said to Allah, Rabbana faqina adab al nar. They said, Oh Allah, protect us from the fire. The first action they did was to ask Allah to protect them against the fire. Because the reason for this is that true and correct reflection makes you makes you realize the ultimate power and the ultimate being and the perfection and the majesty of the one who created you and this is why the greatest power what is the greatest power? I've mentioned this before. Let me ask before I do that. Allah's great or the greatest power altogether. What is the greatest thing that no one can do other than Allah? The greatest power. No. No. It's part of that. To create a sentiment. Who said that? Allah is the The creation. The act of creating. Something from nothing, which is impossible for anyone to do except for Allah. Using the word creation is metaphorically the way they use these days. I created this. I cre no, you didn't create it. You put a few things together and you make this thing. But find me someone who makes something from absolutely nothing. He says, be and it is. Find me someone who can do this. And this is what Allah challenged in another part of the Quran. He said, if the creation altogether, the human and jinn kind, were to come together in order to create what? Not a human being, not the solar system, something much less than that. To create a fly. A fly. Look at this little fly that we kill maybe 100 a day. Look at this. Look at this. Power of Allah. Allah said, you will never be able to create it. A fly, a simple fly. You will never be able to create it, create it. Even if everyone comes together and puts an effort together. And this is why Sheikh Abdullah mentions this, mashallah. Very frequently, again. He says, and this is the reason and the hikmah. That every command in the Quran, listen to this very carefully, and inshallah you'll, you'll start to realize this when you read in the Quran. Now. Every command or prohibition, whether it's a command to do or to command to stop, halal or haram, is either followed or it comes before Allah showing the power of creation. What did uh, in Surah Al Baqarah? The first command in Surah Al-Baqarah, what is it, Yekha? The first command in Surah Al-Baqarah. 
احسنت يا ايها الناس اعبدوا ربكم worship Allah all people all people worship Allah what did he say after that الذي خلقكم لا لا اي والذين من قبلكم ايش لعلك لا يا اخي شو لعلك يا ايها الناس اعبدوا ربكم الذي خلقكم من نفس واحده وخ... يا ايها الناس اعبدوا ربكم الذي خلقكم والذين من قبلكم لعلكم تتقوا احسن تعفوا ايوه هي سيد ورشيب الله هيز كماند فولد باي وات ذا وان هو كرييتد يو هي منشن ذا باور اوف كرييشن بيكوز ذا وان هو هاز ذا ابيليتي تو كرييت از ذا اونلي وان ورثي اوف ورشيب is the only one worthy of worship and this is what makes Allah this is the essence of what makes Allah worthy of worship my dear brothers and sisters the power of creation and this is why no one will create except for Allah no one will create except for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala alladhi khalaqakum walladhina min qablikum created you created your forefathers in order for you to fear him for the same thing here mentioning in in ali imran the in fi khalq as samawati wal coming back to the original ayah that i mentioned they said at the end of mentioning and thinking and pondering about the creation of allah the first thing they asked allah firstly they made a great act of worship which is dua and the nabi sallallahu alaihi wasallam said ad dua huwa al ibad raising the hands and making dua to allah subhanahu wa ta'ala this is the core of al ibad they said oh allah protect us from the fire protect us from the fire you have not made this heavens and the earth in vain you have not made it for no reason and no one can make these things and these clear signs except for the true and one god alone subhanahu wa ta'ala so allah protect us from the fire لا اله الا الله what a great dua to make for a person who realized how small and insignificant he is and how unworthy he is of paradise how unworthy he is of paradise reflection makes a person fearful reflection makes a person realize that if it's not for the savior of allah and the mercy of allah that we are deserving of hell Yes that's correct. And Nabi sallallahu alaihi wasallam said no one or no one's actions will take them to paradise. No one's actions will make them deserving of paradise. Listen to the hadith carefully. They said oh Rasulullah not even you. Yani and Nabi sallallahu alaihi wasallam the ones who the one who perfected his acts of worship and perfected his love and perfected his yani knowing of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and worships allah in the most perfect and yani best of manners he said even me my actions would not take me to or make it deserving of paradise illa an yatagammadani allah bi rahmatihi la ilaha illa except if allah was to yani have mercy upon me we enter jannah from the mercy of allah my dear brothers not from our actions not from our actions meaning in another yani point that all of us deserve hell now to put it in more of a vague viewpoint if you if you like we are all deserving of hell because none of us none of our actions are enough to take us to paradise as we all know the story of the man who has worshiped Allah for such so many years so many years doing nothing except for worshiping Allah and then Allah brings him on, on Yom Al-Qiyamah and he says do you want to go to paradise from my mercy or from your actions he thought about it he goes oh, Allah I've worshiped you Arab. how many years man I want to go to Jannah because I deserve it I worked so hard for this position I worked so hard for Jannah I deserve Jannah I want to get to paradise from my actions. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala put his actions on the scale. And this is a person who perfectly worshiped Allah for how many years? I forgot the hadith. 
60, 70, 80 years. Who remembers the hadith? Huh? Al 500 years. No, something like that. Something crazy. 500 years. على قول الأخ. He said, I worked hard for this, I sweated and I cried for Allah, all this worship, all this sadaqah I gave, all this worship I gave. I deserve Jannah, yakhi. This Jannah, I deserve it from my own actions. Allah put all of his actions, all these years of perfect worshipping on the scale. And he put on the other, on the other side what? Uh, the ni'mah of vision, the ni'mah of his eyes. And they were much heavier more than these 500 years. But Allah took him to, to, to hellfire. Imagine this. That person in reality was deserving of hellfire. And then he goes, Ya Allah, ya, calm down. Ya Rabb. Forgive me, Ya Rabb. I didn't mean it. Khalas, I want to get to Jannah with your power, with your mercy only. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala entered him into paradise. Ya Allah, look at this. La ilaha illallah. All of us are deserving of hellfire, haqiqa. All of us should be fearful. When we think about the power and the majesty of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the perfection of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the uniqueness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and how we created the heavens and the earth and how we created us and how we created our children and how he gave us all of these blessings no doubt pondering upon these matters will bring someone to a realization that no matter what they do to Allah, they can never recompense Allah. Thus making them worthy of Jahannam only. Thus making them deserving of Jahannam only. And this is why those people like Allah says the first thing they do is to protect us from the hellfire. Protect us from the hellfire. Those are who? Those who reflect. Those who have minds Allah mentions. And those who remember Allah standing and sitting and lying down. They are great believers, Yanni. They are great believers. And then they said at the end, Faqina Adab al Nar, Ya Rab. Faqina Adab al Nar. Oh Allah, protect us from the fire. After Al Malik and Malik and Al Malik, we spoke about Ish. Salam, Sahih, and I think that was my last class. I spoke about Salam, that was my last class, Sahih. Salam, yes, Salam. Al Quddus, I said. We spoke about Quddus and then Al Salam. But I think, خلاص. I think I spoke too much already. Al Mohim, the ones who like to uh, see these classes, I think they're on Facebook still, on the HRC page. I can go back and watch this class, and I obviously advise, inshallah, to come up to date with the class. Uh, next week, we Ibn Allah Ta'ala, uh, we'll continue with this series. May Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Ta'ala put barakah in this, in this series and allow us to benefit and allow us to love Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Ta'ala through it. Uh, next week, we will be starting from the name of Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Ta'ala, Al-Mu'min. Al-Mu'min. Uh, please uh, come and benefit, inshallah Ta'ala. And Jazakum uh, Allahu Khairan wa sallallahu wa sallam wa barak ala Rasulullah Muhammad. وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين سبحان ربك رب العزة عما يصفون وسلام على المرسلين والحمد لله رب العالمين أريد أن